Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Hadi Partovi. Hi, thank you very much. Hi, you're welcome. Okay, so Hour of Code, it's in 150 countries. We have 180,000 events scheduled. Just this week alone, millions of people signed up. So I just explained how successful you are in business. So take us back just three years when we started Hour of Code. What drove you to make that huge change and go from being you know, strictly business to taking on this huge uh, effort? Uh, well, I've always been interested in education. You know, I think, uh, you know, I'm an immigrant to this country, and I, when I came to this country, I'd grown up in Iran, and uh, I grew up in Iran actually during the is Islamic Revolution, and the war with Iraq broke out when I was a little kid, and it's not a fun place to grow up during a war. Uh, and my life changed when my dad gave me a computer. Uh, he brought home a Commodore 64, and he said, this doesn't have any apps or games. But if you, here's a book, and if you learn how to code on it, you can make your own games. Uh, and you know, by the time I was 12 or 13, I'd gotten quite good at it, and that's when we moved to America. And my life arc had completely changed because I came to this country really good at computer programming. Uh, and then you know, by the time I was 30-something, 30 30 before I just started Code.org, I realized it's 30 years later, and in this country, the vast majority of kids don't have the same opportunity I had when I was young, and what could we do to help get every child in this country have the opportunity to, to participate in the technology that's changing the world around us? Yeah, incredible. Um, and I know you said you, you left when you were 11, um, and you came here, and your, your mom was a computer scientist, and your dad uh, founded Sheriff University, which is the leading technical university in the Middle East. So Hour of Code this, uh, events this week are happening in Syria, Nigeria, Benghazi, Iraq, Afghanistan. Coming from where you come from and what you've seen, um, how heartwarming is it for you to see these events happening in these countries? And I know that there's even countries where they're holding events in private because they're worried about you know, women getting arrested for going and, and participating. So tell us a little bit about that and that whole background. It's pretty unreal that this thing that we just thought of as an idea two and a half years ago is now so widespread. Uh, there's literally gonna be, I think, 50 million students just this week participating in the Hour of Code. Uh, and you know, for us, we came up with the idea more like an Earth Day. You know, a lot of that is done on our website. A lot of that is people who do it with us. But a lot of it is just countries or groups that are just completely uncoordinated. You know, the the island of Guam is holding an hour of code in in the Indian Ocean, an island I'd never heard of called Cocos Island. Every inhabitant of the island is 650 people who live there. They're all doing the hour of code. That's awesome. Uh, there's a secret country in the Middle East. It's not a secret country, but there's a secret hour of code, which is girls only. And they're saying, don't tell anybody because we don't want retribution. It's like <laughs> the opposite of what would happen in this country. Uh, uh, but my f mo the most ridiculous of these is there's two countries, Italy and Russia, where the top-down Ministry of Education has required every school to participate. So uh, there's going to be more kids doing the Hour of Code in Russia than in the United States. Um, and I love that because you know the United States, we've led in a lot of things, but education has typically not been one of them. We are, we're always ashamed of how our worst test scores in all these other countries, but we've always led at technology. We invented computers or the internet or the smartphone, uh, and when it comes to the computer science education now, this is something which we basically have created that now every single country in the world is adopting, and that's pretty cool. I, think, I mean, I think that really is incredible. It's not that we're standing at this place where we're we, we know everything, and we're trying to do some philanthropic effort for a third world country. We're we're in this in the in our own backyard. It's the it's just the same mess, right? So, um, I think that's really an interesting uh, thing to look at. I know there was a quote I had. Um, uh, Why should people who study in India or China or Russia be equipped with more employable skills than people in the United States? And I think that's you know that really does speak for you know why we need to do so much to bring it home. And yeah, I, I yeah, grew, right. grew up in Iran. I didn't have this opportunity. Right now, Iran has more schools that teach computer science than America does, That's which crazy. is kind of crazy. Yeah. So right now, 90 school districts are embracing computer science. But that's a lot more to go. So what are the biggest challenges that you see? What are the main obstacles that we need to overcome to bring computer science into every classroom? Sure. I'd first say 90 is a big number for the amount of change that's happened in just True. two years. Right. Uh, you know, two years ago, none of these school districts, there wasn't right. a single large district in the country that had computer science uh, as part of the curriculum. And in just two years, the Hour of Code is 
the goal of one hour isn't that you're going to become like a genius computer no, right. programmer. The goal of one hour is you realize that I can do this, or my child can do this, or my classroom can do this, or my school can do this. And every American recognizes that technology is a big deal, but they're a little scared of that coding thing because it's like not for me or not for my, not for my daughter or you know whatever. Uh, and after one hour, you realize it's not as hard as I thought, and it's actually kind of fun, and I can make things. Uh, and that completely changes people's mindset. And because of that, uh, just in two years, we've gotten every one of the largest cities in the country to embrace computer science. In New York City, the mayor has announced an entire citywide, it's a 10-year plan to bring it to every school. But New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, Miami, uh, Las Vegas, Houston, all of these cities have embraced it. I think um, there was a competition, was it Chicago and Boston? They were Chicago and Brooklyn are competing Brooklyn. for the one hour uh, to see who can get the most students to do the hour of code. But uh, both have already laid out plans to put computer science as part of the built-in school That's curriculum. Amazing, yeah. uh, and that, I don't think the education system of any country has gone through this fast of a change. Mm -hmm. uh, and the one hour basically is just to inspire that change. There's a lot of legwork, and you're asking what are the biggest obstacles. Right. The biggest obstacle is the uh, teacher capacity. Most teachers... You know, the average adult in the United States never learned to code, so they can't, if they're a teacher, teach it either. Right. Uh, and our work is mainly training existing teachers so that your biology teacher or your math teacher can also teach one hour of computer science a day. Do you think that's partly um, to do with the generation? Because I, I know two years ago when we were running the first hour of code at the Stanford store, I went to the, to the, code, uh, to the hour of code, and there was a table and there was a couple of extra laptops and all the kids, you know, the parents were bringing this, their children to do it and there were a couple of extra and I talked to some of the parents and said, why didn't you come over and do it? And they're like, oh, no, 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 it's too, you know. So there's still this generational gap where the parents think, oh, you know, my five-year-old, I'm going to bring him and he's going to do it, but it's too difficult for me. And so I, I wonder if that sort of speaks to, to teachers. It's, you know, you're definitely in a role where you're, um, you're the authority figure and so now you're sort of learning at the same speed as your students. There's a lot... You know. This is kind of a hidden secret of the Hour of Code, which is the most important audience in the Hour of Code, is the teachers. Uh, the students are like, oh, that was easy. What's the next thing? Uh, whereas the teachers, they're like, oh, my God, we, we, we just did that. You know? And that's, the teachers actually are the ones who realize that they can actually integrate it into their classroom or into their school. Uh, and once school adopts something as curriculum, then it's there for, for as long as school is Absolutely, there. Absolutely, yeah. And um, so... One of the things I think is interesting about schools so that I see, especially in the US, is this sort of misconception that computer science is computer literacy. And that's so not the case, right? Even for my kids, they, oh, we do, I do computers. And I say, what do you learn? Oh, we learn how to you know, go on the internet and create a Word doc. And it's like, no, no, computer science. So what do we need to do to change that? What are your thoughts around you know, this sort of notion that computer lab is computer science? Yeah, that's, that's actually part of why we're called code.org. You know, mm -hmm. we're about the field computer science. Uh, but if you say to the average school uh, administrator or to the average parent, what's computer science? They'll say, oh, it's learning how to use the internet, learning mm -hmm. how to make animations or, you know, presentations or whatnot. Uh, and then and if you ask them what about computer programming, they're like, oh, yeah, that too. Uh, but computer programming is really the heart of computer science. Right. Uh, and the reason why we're called code.org is because coding isn't something that most schools teach. Uh, three quarters of schools in this country don't have any kind of computer programming right. courses. Right. And another one of the things that you, that you have with your um, teacher-led curriculum is that you actually have teacher notes, right, that go with it. Correct. And those are based on grade and based on subject, right? Yeah. So I think that's super helpful. The teachers feel there's a resource that they can go to to learn. And in fact, anyone can go there and, and learn. Anyone can host an hour of code. So I think that's, that's important too. So. Um, let's take a step back and, uh, and talk about diversity, the diversity issue. Um, so in the high school um, advanced placement test for computer science, it has um, the worst gender diversity um, across all courses. So it's 78% men and 22% women, and only 13% uh, people of color. Um, but when you put those groups, those underrepresented groups together, that's 65% of you know, the US population. So there's a lot of work to do. Um, I don't know, when I was a child, I went to an all-girls school. And so there was, no, um, there was no perception of a boy's subject, a girl's subject, which I know is something that's, that, that plays into you know, this notion that you have to be sort of a geeky boy to want to do computer science. 
Um, and so I think that's one of the things that's going to make it so important to um, make sure that CS is part of the core curriculum so that all kids are exposed to it and then they get to decide, just like geography or history, do I like it or do I not like it? So in the meantime, while we're working on getting code.org um, and curriculum into every class, how do we... Um, how do we stop this idea that CS is for nerdy white guys only? What can we do for these poor girls? Um, well, the first thing we could do is just by changing that. Uh, and I would say actually CS is no longer for nerdy white guys. It's not. We've, we've had 50 million girls <laughs> right. try an hour of code. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are young girls, older girls, they're white girls, mm -hmm. black girls. After 50 million girls can do something, it's pretty much that's over. Role that models, think, right? yeah, that's the role models, right? That basically just changes mm -hmm. the, the facts on the ground. Adults still, still think that. Uh, you know, exactly anybody right, my right? age, mm -hmm. when we went to school, that was the stereotype, and that's, that's how it is. Mm -hmm. If you go to any fifth grade that has done the Hour of Code, not a single child thinks you know, that's for a boy or for a girl. Right. Uh, the Hour of Code is a 50-50 kind of thing. Uh, and there's now 200,000 classrooms that have taken our follow-on curriculum, and there's 6 million kids in there uh, more than two million of them are girls taking full computer science classes. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's really what we've got to do, right? Is just keep that classes going, um, and really. But I think part of it is, like I was saying earlier, is educating the, the parents too, right? And I think I think the stats are 48% of the people have done Hour of Code worldwide are, are women, which is incredible when you think about some of the countries where it's not accessible to girls, right? So, correct. That's you know that's phenomenal. Um, so I also saw, uh, saw a stat about. Um, the average time students spend um, on science in general went from three hours down to one and a half hours over 10 years. So given that, where does CS fit into STEM subjects overall in science? Um, but also, how can, we, um, how can we change teachers' perspectives so that they, they realize that computer science can actually help learning some of these other STEM subjects, right? When you see, when you're learning, you know, graphing or you're trying to understand slope of a line, how, how you see that visually using computer science can really help you understand a concept. So there's, there's that piece of learning to do too, right? Yeah, code.org's curriculum, I mean, our one hour stuff is really just, I'd say, for celebratory fun. We have this whole curriculum for putting it throughout elementary and middle and high school, and that includes pieces that you integrate into a math class that teach algebra but using computer science, or teaching you know science class using computer science. For an example, you know, if you want to teach how uh, an, an ecosystem grows and if, how will fish grow in a pond if there's too much food or not enough food, you can't run an experiment in the science lab. To, to, you need a pond. But you can also write code to simulate that pond mm -hmm. and then run an experiment and say, well, what if there's too much food? What happens? You know, then suddenly you have lots and lots and lots of fish and then the fish overpopulate. Right. And if you have not enough food, they die and you realize you need to find the right balance. And that, that, that's a science experiment. Perfect. But you write the code to actually run the experiment as part of it. And that's why it's going to be so critical for teachers, right? To train teachers and make sure that whatever we roll that out, the teachers are, are really feel empowered to do those kinds of experiments. Yeah. And we're already now, we're a two-year-old organization. We're already among the largest teacher training organizations in the country. It's that's somewhat awesome. crazy. We've trained almost 20,000 new teachers to, to do computer science. Wow. And in the next 12 months, we're going to have 25,000 new teachers uh, wow. trained, which is amazing. That is amazing. So you talked a little bit about your curriculum. So this year you rolled out two new, last year was Frozen, that was the, that was the moment to refer. Um, oh, every kid at Halloween was uh, whatever the princess is. I'm not a princess person, clearly. Um, and this year you worked with Disney and Lucasfilm and uh, tell us about your two new curriculum. Yeah, I don't know if I assume people here know, but how many of the people here have heard of Star Wars? <laughs> and how many have heard of Minecraft? Uh, those are the two tutorials we have this year. It's kind of, you know, be, I've, we've just been beyond ourselves to be I'm able to work sure. with not only one, but both of those brands. Uh, you know, for, in both cases, we were trying to see what's the absolute most awesome thing that kids will be most into. And we were working with both companies, and then having both say yes was somewhat crazy. Um, what's also really cool, you were asking about, you know, how the Hour of Code is being done in all these countries that are in kind of in divided times and extreme right. times. You know, at a, at a time when our whole world, and even in this country, is so divided, what's really cool about this campaign is, you know, we have a tutorial featuring Minecraft, which is a Microsoft brand. It's built using open source by Google. Mm -hmm. It's hosted on websites managed by Amazon. 
and it's being featured in an Apple store. It's amazing. Uh, the and the fact that Microsoft, right Google, thing. Amazon, and mm -hmm. Apple are all coming together on this is pretty cool. That's amazing. And I know that you, you know, for a lot of people, they think hour of code, but you have a 20-hour curriculum there. Um, and some of the things that you, you also have is you have an offline curriculum too, right? So tell us why that's important when you're talking about these kind of... Uh, the wider scope of people. Sure. Our, our overall curriculum, we have almost 300 hours worth of, of coursework, wow. uh, which is for putting it into real schools. That's not something that right. your average kid will just pick up and do. Some, some might. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, for international countries, we regularly are told, you know, we don't have the internet access to run something right. that's online, and schools want just like a thumb drive that they can then pass around. So we have offline versions of that as well for, for those countries. That's great. And I know that there's you also... also there's also ahead. unplugged tutorials, which don't even need a computer, or tutorials that you can do on a phone if you don't have a computer, or just paper and pencil type of tutorials that, that kids are doing in Africa and places that don't have electricity. So there's no excuses, basically. <laughs> you got to do it. Um, okay, so... What when people leave tonight and they, they what did, what should their takeaway be? What should they be? What do you want the audience to be doing? Are you trying to inspire everyone to go run their own hour of code? I mean, we're basically sitting up here saying you have no excuses. There's online versions, there's offline versions. You can get kids to pair up, and in fact, uh, one of the things that that we talk about is actually pair programming is is important, and it helps kids to realize that it's uh, you know. It, it's a, it's a sport or, it's, you know, it's actually good to partner up on uh, coding because that's the real world. So, uh, you know, what, what, would, what are you asking the audience? The first thing I would say would be trying just five minutes of one of our Hour of Code tutorials. Uh, they're all called Hour of Code. They take about 25 minutes right. if you're an adult. Mm -hmm. uh, but in five minutes, it will totally change people's minds about what coding is because most people's impressions of coding is about ones and zeros or typing semicolons and angle brackets and like gobbledygook, uh, whereas our tutorials, you just drag and drop the commands and they're super fun. You know, you get BB-8, the little droid from Art Star Wars doing things for you. And in five minutes, just getting a sense of this is what it's about isn't a big deal. Um, but for the adults here, the most important thing you could do is if you're a parent, ask your child's teacher to support, to basically do the hour of code in the classroom or to actually go beyond and why, is it, why doesn't our school teach computer science? The more parents ask schools to teach computer science, the faster we'll change the school system. 100%, and I, quick plug for my dad. When I was 13, uh, my dad was head of uh, math and physics department, and he was the one that realized, hey, this is an all-girls school. We should be doing a computer science curriculum. And so he was the one that went out and work, worked it out and then taught it. So I think I probably should be paying yeah. him back a little better than but, I am. But the reason to try it yourself is because you can't ask your teacher to do something if you right. are like, I don't even know what it is myself, right. but like, I want, you, I want you to teach it to my kids because the teacher will be like, I don't know either. Mm -hmm. you know? But if as an adult, you're like, I tried it for five minutes, it wasn't that hard, why aren't we doing this in the classroom? It, it makes a big difference. Or volunteer to run it at your kid's class too, right? Okay, so um, at this point, I just want to stop the questions just for a minute. Um, and I have another video I'd love to show you. Um, if you would like to play, that would be awesome. So I think this really shows that this isn't just a good idea. This is really something that can change lives. And so we have a little bit of a surprise tonight. We have Luna Ruiz, who is um, featured in the video here. And we're going to ask her a couple of questions. She's going to share some of the time with us. <laughs> Welcome, Luna. Hello. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is um, Luna. I'm a um, senior in high school. I go to the Academy for Software Engineering. So. Excellent. So. Where do you think computer science is going to take you? Are you going to be the next Hadi, <laughs> the next Hillary Clinton, the next Luna? Um, well, it's hard to tell where CS is going to take me in the future. Um, well, one of the role models that I look up to is Stephanie Mayer, uh, the CEO of Yahoo. Mm -hmm. The fact that she, she started off as an engineer at Google and uh, where they were mostly male. She was that um, one of the few women to take on that role. So I thought that was very inspiring. So that's where I see myself in the future, maybe working for a huge tech company like Apple or Google. Or maybe starting your own tech company? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'm thinking about that too. I think you're ready already. <laughs> so if you were to create an app, what kind of app would you create? What's an app that you think should be created? Uh, 
I, um, being a senior in high school and going through the college application, I definitely um, find it hard to manage time. So maybe like a specialized alarm clock mm -hmm. in terms of like, for example, if there are delays on the train station, you know, being from New York, you take the subway. Uh -huh. If there was a way where my alarm could be, you know, um, fixed so that I could wake up at a certain time so that I could beat those delays or something. So it wakes you up earlier yeah, if there's traffic yeah. and it wakes you up later if it's so bad that yeah. you might as well just stay in bed and sleep, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, no, that's a good idea. So you're so driven, Luna, and so accomplished at such an early age. Thank you. So, yeah. What does it feel like to be a role model? Maybe there's some kids here that are looking up and saying, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> well, um, I didn't think of myself as being a role model until um, probably right now. <laughs> So um, it just makes me feel pretty good. Um, I feel like I'm returning the favor, you know, growing up with my mother who is a social worker and watching her um, working shelters and helping people. I always felt that those were values were instilled in me. Mm -hmm. So I always felt like I had to, you know, give back myself. And being so passionate about coding, I wanted to spread the word about it and get more people into it. And you have younger siblings too, right? So Yeah, yeah. You can start a company, you can bring them in. You can boss them around and it's totally legit. <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing, uh, you have such a great accomplishments is on his sports. And it's being an athlete myself, I think there's a lot of parallels between sports Definitely, and yeah. the workforce, right? There's teamwork, being a team player, yeah. leading a team to victory, bringing a team together after they you know, suffer a defeat, no matter how small. <laughs> so keep that up too. Yeah, and it's also... Um, when, when you're in a tech company, it's about collaboration, about playing your part, but making sure that your part corresponds with other people. So the fact that you can, you're playing that small role, but mm -hmm. when, when those roles are put together, it creates a unit. Totally. Nobody so, creates something in a vacuum, right? Yeah. You might create some tiny, small yeah. part of it, but everyone has to come together to create and the whole. And everyone has to offer something different and special exactly. to make the team. Exactly. That's why diversity is so important, yeah. right? Everyone's got to bring a different idea to the table. Awesome. So, Hadi, do you have any questions for Luna before we open it up to the floor for both of you? Have you decided what you want to major in when you go to school? Well, um, I do like software, but also like um, hardware. So, I'm thinking about Excellent. majoring in computer engineering. You're thinking about where you might want to work? <laughs> 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 All right. So, uh, we're going to open it up so that you guys have a chance to ask questions. Um, if you have anything, uh, I think we have Mike. Microphone uh, runners, if you have questions, don't be shy. At what age did you get started, and how did you, I guess, first start opening up a coding program and say, okay, this is what I want to do, you know, when I grow up? How did you go about that initial phase? Um, well, when I was in middle school, um, we had a technology course. However, it wasn't um, coding. It was Microsoft Office and PowerPoint. But my techni technology teacher came up to me and talked to me about um, a new school that was opening up called the Academy for Software Engineering, which is the school I'm in now. He said, um, it's a new school. They're, they're teaching computer science, which I didn't know what it, what, what, what it was at the time. And he said, you know, you should check it out. There's going to be new teachers, new equipment. Why not? So when I went to the open house to see them, I saw that they had 3D printers. Now. At a young age, I, I thought that was pretty cool. And, and, and when, when I went, I saw that they were making small little logos. So they're um, on the 3D printer. And that, that's when I knew this school had an idea, the fact that they had a logo and a brand that they wanted to sell. So I knew they, they were going somewhere. And I wanted to be a part of that. So that's when I, I, um, I joined the school. After, the joining, after joining the school, this is where I learned how to um, code. I started off with Python, um, just creating a hello world. So just making um, it print hello world in the, in the um, PowerShell. And that's pretty much how it started. I wanted to make a comment about that, which is that people regularly ask, you know, where did you learn you know, computer science or coding? They never ask, like, where did you learn math? Or where did you learn biology? Uh, because there's an obvious question. There's, I'm sorry, there's an obvious answer to that question. You do that in school. Uh, whereas in her case, she had to go to a special school because the vast majority of schools just don't even teach this field. Uh, but the great news is, at least uh, 
eventually every single New York City school is going to be teaching computer science. It's a five to 10 year rollout to reach all uh, 1,000 schools in the city. Uh, but, but that is actually where this should be taught. So you're not wondering where do I need to go to learn it. It should just be where you are already sending your kids. Um, this question is for Luna. I'm in third grade and I'm, I'm, I want to get started. How do you recommend that I start? <laughs> the hour of code. <laughs> yeah, go to www.code.org and then click the button that's called start. I, I've done two of them already, but I want to know where to go from there. I see. If you've already done those, then there's actually a link for going beyond the hour of code, and there's multiple 20-hour tutorials depending on your grade range, uh, and you should try one of those. If you've done all of those, then I have a different answer for you. Yeah. There's also a um, new curriculum they rolled out in Khan Academy. They do um, an hour of drawing with code, uh, creating databases, an hour of databases, I think they call it, an hour of web pages. Um, and of course, um, on iTunes U, there's a whole plethora of courses. There's a million apps to teach you how to code. Um, we have iBooks on Swift, which is Apple's own uh, development uh, language. So you should definitely go and learn how to code in Swift, because then you'll be ready to go. That, that sounds very interesting. Thanks. Thank you for being brave enough to ask a question. That's awesome. Uh, this question is for Hadi. Um, so first, I just want to say thank you for coming to the event and more broadly for the movement that you've started. I'm a big believer. Um, the question is around, you get to see the space holistically. Um, where do you think are the gaps where, obviously, you, you know, you guys started the movement. There are a lot of other nonprofits that, that are also, you know, taking the charge as well. Uh, where do you see any opportunities for for-profit companies to really come in and, and help fill in any gaps that, that may exist right now? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, the biggest gap I'm worried about isn't actually a for-profit one, but is the, uh, I think, university sort of reaction to what's happening. Basically, we have really changed the K through 12 landscape already enough. And even the changes, some of them are going to happen over the next few years, and they haven't happened yet, like the New York City changes and so, so on. Um, most universities aren't ready to deal with all the new incoming CS majors or people who want to study computer science. Uh, and the other issue universities have is they need to be training new computer science teachers to basically go into all the schools that are going to need that. Uh, and that's a change. That's not necessarily a for-profit change. But that's the biggest gap in the work we're doing is we haven't impacted that yet. From a for-profit standpoint, I think uh, the work we're doing in K through 12 is really foundational. You don't go to you know a public school to learn something that will immediately get you into a job. When you when you learn a biology class in high school, you're not a surgeon the next day. Uh, whereas computer programming is something in high school can teach you the most basic stuff. But you know, learning a new computer language or how to take what you learned in school to make an actual iPhone app and then get it into the store and sell it and make money doing it, that's a much more vocational track, which if you go to the average public school, they don't want to have something that's so specific to one technology or one career. Uh, and I think there'll be a great demand for kids who've learned enough to, to get started, but then want to know, all right, how do I actually make money from this? Um, and that's actually a little bit of a track that's like skipping college, because if you know the like she could probably, within a year of training, get into a job. And I don't want to suggest people not go to college, but I think there's a lot of people who just don't go to college. Uh, you know, we have I think 30 to 40 percent of Americans just don't. Uh, and but if but they could, with one year of training, get a double as as much paying job if somebody sort of led them down that path. And there are a lot of those sort of vocational schools, right, that are doing these like t even 12 month programs where it really. You know, in certain subjects, obviously, you can't be a doctor on a you know one-year accelerated course. But for something like coding, where it is so specific, I think you know that that is an option, right? When college is so expensive. Yep. That is the fastest-growing private section of the education world right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and these these boot camps, you know, there there's good ones, there's bad ones, but on average, they have a very high placement rate into jobs and immediately increase people's salaries. Right. And uh, I think that's one of the things that is so interesting about coding and the, sort of the app environment right now is that it really is making coding and sort of accessible to everyone. And one of my favorite sort of stories is uh, we're responsible for the Worldwide Developer Conference. And we have developers from all over. And um, 
a, a couple of years ago, I was standing in line, and just I always like to talk to the developers and see who's out there, um, and talked to this guy and said, hey, how did you get into app development? Which company are you with? And he said, well, I'm a gardener. And I was like, oh, OK. And he said, you know, I work in Los Altos, which is a really um, affluent area in um, the Bay Area. And he said, you know, I wanted to create an app for my clients and tell them, you know, where they were budget-wise, pictures of what their project looked like. And so I went to look for somebody to create this app for me and started, you know, Googling stuff. And, you know, pretty much before you know it, I'm learning from 13-year-olds on YouTube and it became fascinating. And he said, you know, after a while, my wife is like, what are you doing? You're, you're spending as much time on the computer as you are out in the garden. But... He, the way he said it was he was able to immerse himself in coding the way he was able to immerse himself in gardening and found he had such an aptitude for it. And I thought that's really interesting, right? You don't, just because you may see yourself as a gardener, you may have an aptitude for something that you just never even knew existed. You never knew you were even interested in it. So, you know, I think that's, you know, it it's, speaks so highly for um, the opportunities that are out there right now for coding. Yeah, I think... Everybody, whether you're American or in any country in the developed world, has the sense that technology provides so much opportunity to, to change the world, whether to change the world for the better or for worse, to make a lot of money, to help people. Uh, it's just is like this magical thing. And then the vast majority of us just don't participate in it uh, other than sort of being or sort of recipients of it. You know, like Airbnb is changing how hotels work or, you know, Agriculture is being changed, entertainment is being changed, everything is get, getting changed. Uh, and who wouldn't want to participate in that right. if they could? I mean, I, I saw a stat that there is, there'll be one million unfilled computer science jobs by, 20, uh, by 2020, right? So, and that's a $500 billion opportunity. So who in the heck shouldn't want to go code? Be a part of that, especially, you know, students looking for what should I do? It seems like sort of a no-brainer. At least start there if you don't know, right, Luna? <laughs> And just going back to what I said in the video, like just being a producer instead of a consumer, like knowing what, what's out there and how, how things come to be, like how was um, Facebook invented, how was Instagram invented, how was your favorite social media um, networks were invented, and just try, um, becoming more knowledgeable in those subjects and in that area. Absolutely. Well, Hattie can tell you all those things. <laughs> um, so Hattie, let's get to you for a sec. So, I read that you say you work 70 hours a week and that's been going on for several years. So what's the future look like for you? When, when do you say, that's it, I've got success, or are you just going to go until your toes up? Uh, I'm hoping to slow down a little bit, but I'm extremely in love with what I'm doing. I have the coolest job in the world. You know, people don't look at education and think that it's something that can change. Uh, you know, the U.S. education system... Most people think of it and think it kind of is not great. Uh, mm -hmm. But actually, U.S. schools are changing. And U.S. Right. teachers, they've woken up with a degree of passion that this is something they want for their students, for their future. Uh, and that's like an awesome story. And being at the center of helping America's schools change and bringing opportunity to the poorest cities, to the poorest neighborhoods in places like Los Angeles, uh, you know, places like Miami, places like New York City, mm -hmm. it's such a great thing to be doing. So. Uh, you know, I would love to work even more than 70 hours a week if I could uh, just to see it happen. And, and I don't think I'll stop until every single school in this country is teaching computer science. Excellent. I like to hear that. But how long is that going to take? Um, my optimistic view is five years, which is extremely fast for the pace of change of a trillion dollar a year bureaucracy, which is what our school system is. But uh, three but years it, ago, you didn't know that you could reach 100 million kids. Yeah, but yeah, exactly. But what's happening is already there's entire states... You know, the state of Arkansas, uh, this is a fascinating story. Asa Hutchinson saw his grandniece doing the Hour of Code, and then he was running for governor, and he basically took our materials, our marketing materials from our website, and said, I'm going to run for governor and make this part of the Arkansas school system. Just this past November, he won the election, not, not this November, but one year ago. In February, he passed a law. In, August, in April, it was in the budget. And then this September, every single school in Arkansas is already teaching computer That's science. Fantastic. They've six-tupled the number of students in the field. Like, one state is down. Uh, so 49 more to go. Wow. Um, but we've just announced partnerships with the state of Idaho, the mm -hmm. state of Utah. Uh, there's another state uh, that we haven't announced yet. So we're now actually doing state-by-state-level partnerships to bring this to all the school systems. Uh, 
it's pretty crazy that the America's school system is changing that fast, and it's really right. motivating to work on it. I bet. I mean, and to have been part of, you know, that as an idea, and then that as something that's being fulfilled, that's got to feel really good. Yeah, to, to have come up with something just two and a half years ago, and having 50 million students in schools in every single country doing it, it's crazy. I'd never, ever thought that would be possible, but... Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't really want to sleep. I'd rather be doing this. Yeah. What's the, what's the biggest piece you haven't been able to solve yet? I would probably say just the bureaucracy of schools. Yeah. yeah. So, mm -hmm. like, we, we are working in the most bureaucratic systems. Uh, you know, every single school in this country has a school board, mm -hmm. and that board is elected, and they get to decide what they want to do, and getting them to do something different is not always easy. Right. The For fact sure. that so many of them have changed their minds and adopted this in just two years has been shocking, but they're, right. still, they're still slow. Right. And Luna, what about you? What's the biggest challenge you have to overcome? In terms of? Like your career, your aspirations. I know we were talking a little bit back oh. and you were saying that you've been mostly focused on, on coding on the web. And so what's, what's your next, what's the next big thing you want to do? Um, first off, go to a good college. Like, definitely good. We're putting in a plug for Stanford for <laughs> Luna here. We're going to put this in her application. <laughs> um, just, I guess, just be, being a female mm -hmm. and and just being being that role model for, like, millions of young girls around the world. Which and you are doing put, very um, spreading the word, pretty much. Yeah. Excellent. How am I supposed to actually tell my, tell my school to, to embrace computer science? That's a great question. If you go to code.org, whether it's you or your dad who's sitting next to you, uh, there's a petition you can sign. Uh, but there's a, there, we actually have a letter that you can send to your school. That's actually, we've drafted it for you. If you sign our petition, we'll send you an email saying, here's a letter. Please take this to your school. Uh, I'll do and that I, soon. And I did it for my kids, and they're all doing Hour of Code this week, so the whole school is doing it. So I think it's, you know, just as you're standing up and asking questions, being brave, and just putting it out there and asking. And if they think it's too hard, then get up there and show them that you can do it for them. Nothing like inspiring a teacher by showing them that you can already do it, right? Other questions? So, I mean, I work in computer science. I've been a sysadmin forever. Is there also focus on hardware engineering, like Luna mentioned, network security systems, or is it just coding at this point? Uh, actually, code.org, we're named code.org, but we, our curriculum is about all parts of computer science. So actually, if, you, you know, if your son, uh, if you can convince his teacher to introduce our elementary school curriculum into the elementary school, even from grades K through five, it teaches things like how does the internet work, which has nothing to do with coding, but it has to do with like packet switching. Uh, and that doesn't involve doing it on computers. It involves exercises where the kids actually like make little packets on paper and pass them around and see how you can transmit a message from child to child until it gets to the destination, which is how the internet works too, but most people don't know that. Uh, or it teaches things like cybersecurity or digital citizenship and how to be safe online and what things you can trust. All of these things are part of computer science and part of what I think every student, actually every adult needs to know. Uh, you know, it turns out the number one fear Americans have isn't terrorism or burglary or murder or getting shot, it's getting hacked. Uh, right. It's the number one fear people have in terms of a crime that could happen to them because it probably has already happened. Uh, and if it hasn't already happened, it'll probably happen this year. Uh, and most Americans don't actually know how to be safe online. Uh, that's also something that our curriculum teaches. And there's lots of, you know, robotics and those kinds of after-school programs, this uh, robotics apps, Sphero, those kinds of things. There's a lot of good things. Okay, the gentleman behind you. Um, you mentioned that there was a, a shortage of um, teaching um, and teaching code. Um, how do you expect or it, are there any programs around that um, intend to accelerate that lack of um, knowledge? Yeah, you're looking at it right here. Um, we're literally training 2,000 teachers every single month that are existing American teachers who are teaching math class, science class, tech class, English class, and want to be offering at least one hour a day of computer science class. And they go through our training program and basically can now offer at least some, some level of computer science in their, in their schools. 
So just this September, 15,000 new classrooms in the United States started teaching not just one hour, but full computer science classes uh, thanks to our work. And next September, uh, in nine months, we'll have another 25,000 classrooms. That's getting the existing American teacher workforce to adopt a new field. Uh, the thing we need to do is to get America's colleges, that's where all new teachers are made. Every teacher we train is gonna eventually quit their job and we don't wanna be doing this for the rest of time. We want America's colleges to basically, where new teachers go to learn to be teachers, to be doing that. Uh, and that's, I guess, our next problem to crack. Awesome. Well, I think we have to leave it there for today. Um, but thank you all so much. Um, to follow up, please go apple.com slash retail slash code. You can get links to the Hour of Code, links to these podcasts, links to other events that are happening for Hour of Code um, this week. Um, and you can also get access to some of those things we talked about, the iTunes U classes, um, some of the great apps that we have around coding. So we hope to see at least your younger ones um, on the Apple campus soon as our nearest recruits. Um, otherwise, thank you to everyone for spending time with us this evening. <laughs>